when it comes to, you know, reduce, reuse, recycle, most of us really just focus on recycling. You know, it's still creating a lot of waste. So for me, I really am trying to get people to identify the reduction part first. I'm Dr. Lamont Repolet, the president of Kane, New Jersey's Urban Research University. This is Urban Impact, a podcast where we examine the complex issues facing urban communities through meaningful conversations with scholars, community leaders, and others who are driving change. Recorded and produced on our campus in Union, New Jersey, this is Urban Impact. Here are your hosts, Michael Salvatore and Barbara George Johnson. You know, when I was a kid, I, I, I used to skateboard a lot. And there were occasionally there were kids who wanted to skateboard and who would carry around a skateboard, but they never did. And we would call them posers. We'd be like, oh, this kid's a poser. Like, I hear sustainability so much nowadays, but are people really doing it? Like, are people really putting forth the effort to change behavior? Because I know sometimes it's hard to say, I'll pass on the straw, as simple as that can be. But imagine trying to uh, change something you've done for a really long time, maybe forever, maybe for generations in your family, because you know it has a greater impact on society. So today, I think we're gonna be talking a lot to people who are not posers, to people who are really doing this sustainable work, uh, the sexy work that uh, is really important to our society. And to your point, Michael, I think that I heard somewhere that if we can teach our three-year-olds to think about sustainability, uh, we can change, you know, the, the future of, of our country and the behavior in the globe, right? Because kids focus on things that they learn early, right? so we're changing that behavior, the way that they think about um, recycling and reusing and redapting, right? And then they teach their parents to do it, so and when, grandparents to do it. So when I was a superintendent, we had we had launched uh, several initiatives around sustainability. Nothing more powerful than having a preschooler tell a mayor of a city, you know, we really need to cut down on these plastic bags. We need to, uh, we, we need to save sea turtles because we're using too many straws. So you, you're right. The power uh, that, that is happening with our children today and their voice and, and how impactful that is, is, is certainly important. So I'm excited to introduce our guest uh, today, who is Professor Allison Edgley, who is a lecturer in the Department of Communication, Media, and Journalism here at Kane University. And there's so, to our point earlier uh, discussion, there's so much for us to break down and understand about sustainability. You are really looking at sustainability from a global perspective in terms of communication, uh, interaction, journalism, how we uh, engage in leadership and understanding of leadership in the um, movement and advancement of sustainability. So I would love for you to just give us a little bit of your background and talk about um, how you connect the area of communications and leadership to sustainability. Oh, absolutely. I've actually been working for Kane University for about 17 years now. I've uh, started out as an academic specialist and then as an adjunct, I was able to then acquire a full-time position in the communication department. So I'm very enmeshed, you know, I, I love Kane. I've been here uh, for a very long time and I, I continue, you know, I intend to continue that as well. And so what I have really done in my classes, I've you know followed the rubrics and all the things that I need to do, but I've also tried to be a mentor, be initiator, you know, and, and an environmental warrior and really show my students through, you know, doing things myself that you can lead change, even if it's very small, very small acts at a time. And that it doesn't have to be an entire overhaul of change. It can just be, you know, little individual steps that can really bring us to this idea of sustainability and this idea that we can be efficient and effective for the long term and really not deplete our resources that we know are not going to be renewable, you know, forever. So I'm, I'm learning that you are on the Presidential Task Force for Sustainability. Correct. Right. Yes. And I think recently we've kind of accomplished something in terms of our stars rating. Yes. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Sure. I was very happy to see our silver star. And of course, you know, gold is the next step. It was definitely a collaborative team effort. This was not just one person who was talking about sustainability. We had subcommittees. We met. We talked about what we could do together and how we could really evaluate and assess the different 
um, aspects of the school and the university. And so because I was communication, I was added to the engagement subcommittee. And I found that through that, I was able to build a community building course. So my entire course that semester, when I was uh, really active on the committee, we dedicated that to trying to create communication materials, uh, different ads, different promo videos, uh, different YouTube videos, even audio clips to really try to see if we could find a way to engage our students. Because we find that, you know, as community, the students are really the ones that we want to reach. We want them to start thinking about their behaviors, what they're doing on campus, their level of waste. And so by doing that as a class, not only was I informing and educating those students, but I was getting them to help to identify key areas of opportunity for the university to actually increase their sustainability and think about, you know, what would really resonate with the students? What is actually practical? What is something we can do as a community? So as you talk to students about um, decreasing waste and improving environmental conditions, I like the idea that you are engaging them as a community. Do they see themselves as a community? Do they understand the community principle as in seeing the university um, as, a, as, as its own sort of geographic space that they can control and, and, and work with and engage in? I believe we're starting to get that sense of community. I know that with the dynamic of our students being commuters, there are a lot of you know students that come and go. They don't always think about you know that candy wrapper or that extra bottle of water because they need hydration before class, you know, and maybe don't have the time to fill up their own water bottle. And so I have found that students are starting to they have the talks, they know what needs to be done, but I don't know that they have really come together in that sense to really identify the different aspects that we already do on campus and start to really try to, you know, be initiators and also be participants in that way. So, Mike, I just want to ask, so we talked about just, you know, the little things that can we can do as individuals, as uh, a group, as students, faculty, et cetera, to make change. Uh, it sounds like there's almost a campaign there that says one small step makes a difference, right? Yes. So talk to me a little bit about some of the small steps that have been taken or that you all are starting to think about how students could take, and each of us actually, uh, to make that difference. Absolutely. There are some really key initiatives on campus. We do have uh, Professor Moon, Professor H working on the composting. Uh, Dr. Shebitz has been vital in really integrating and, and creating the the sustainability committee committee and really keeping us thriving and for the kind of individual pieces a couple of us have decided let's take on a couple initiatives and i've been fortunate enough to really align myself with like-minded individuals after being on this task force i've made some really key um, connections and what we started to do first was just collect plastic just you know join a program let's see what we do you know, test it out and, you know, do a little trial period. And we were fortunate enough in that first wave to be able to actually collect 500 pounds of plastic. And that diverted all of that plastic from improper uh, landfills and water systems. And so once we were able to hit that 500 on a small scale, just two instructors trying to, you know, make a change and also educate students and the community, because not only were we collecting from Kane students, but we were also talking to our peers and to our other colleagues in other spaces about what they could do to contribute. When I was at the Founders, uh, Founders Day last year, actually at the race, the alumni association was actually hosting a lot of the the food and the other engagement. And I told them, hey, can I take some of that plastic out of the garbage, you know, the water bottles that you have? And even just doing that started a conversation. Well, what are they for? What are, why are you collecting garbage? You know, I get that question a lot. Why are you collecting garbage? Why are you taking that off the ground? And I'm like, because I know where I can put it in a proper receptacle. This is not going to actually get recycled or this is not going to get destroyed in a proper way. I want to bring it to a space that it can be. So I have definitely collected garbage on campus. And that was a big part, you know, having that campaign already through Nextrex. So Nextrex is actually the company that started the campaign. They're trying to actually integrate many many schools, both uh, K through 12 and also higher education institutions. 
to really think about their level of waste and how much plastic they're consuming. So by bringing it into Kane, we haven't really rolled it out large, large scale for everyone to be contributing because we knew that managing that flow would, you know, be a little bit difficult. But we have successfully uh, earned one bench 500 pounds, a second bench 500 pounds, and now we are moving into our third bench, and we have to get a thousand pounds for the third bench. But by then, we will now be up to two thousand pounds of plastic that we've diverted in less than three years. That's amazing. It is. Um, you know, does anybody ever call you a dumpster diver? Uh, <laughs> luckily, no, because I haven't actually gone headfirst into one before. But even my students in my classes, they see me look in the garbage before we even start class. I see, is there anything in there that I can take out? Then if I can, even if it's, you know, a, a Doritos bag, which someone saw me take out the other day as well, I take that out. But I also add the other element of the compost. I, I'm very much about having my, my students' needs be met in class. And I know that sometimes even someone who is food secure might come to class hungry. So I'm very big on snacks. All my students know that I love to have snacks in class. So what I started to initiate that way, so we have our plastics, but then what I also do is I give them snacks, but then collect their wrappers. And I've started to build this as a consistent type of act every class. The students know if I have an apple and orange or a banana, I'm gonna put the compost in this bag. If I have my snack, I'm going to make sure I dump everything that's in there in the compost bag, and then I also will recycle my plastic. So that's another initiative that I do on my own. I purchased uh, TerraCycle boxes, and TerraCycle is actually an amazing program. Uh, they have free programs, they have pay for programs, and I have scoured their entire website looking for different ways that I can make my own household a no-waste household. Anything that I can possibly properly divert from a landfill or improper recycling, I absolutely try. And by buying one of these boxes now, I can take those candy wrappers so I can give them candy, I can give them snacks, but also not create waste because I realized that was occurring. If I'm giving out things and not collecting back, then I'm not really part of the, the change. I'm really creating more of this problem. So I decided I would, you know, take my own money, buy one of these boxes and see what happens. And I've actually already filled an entire one. It was about eight pounds of candy wrappers just from a semester and a half. And so now I've uh, submitted another box, which was slightly larger. I haven't seen that come in yet to see how much. Much. But in general, as an individual, I have been able to recycle properly over 60 pounds of waste. Uh, they also have cigarette butt recycling. They take socks. They take Colgate, takes all of your toothpaste items. And it's unfortunate that more people don't know about this because they really try to make it easy with their call to action. All you have to do is sign up. All you have to do is click a button, download an actual mailing label, find a box. We all have boxes from Amazon. We know this and put your item in there and then drop it off at a location. You don't have to worry about, you know, trying to pay your postage, get reimbursed, nothing. They realize that that's not a way to get people to be able to be more sustainable. And so I've tried to integrate that and also tell my students when they ask me like, oh, these are really cute apples. I'm like, yeah, I got them in my Misfits box. Oh, what's Misfits? Oh, they're a company that tries to repurpose imperfect food. They try to make sure that anything that is going to be uh, expiring or going bad in a few days actually gets eaten. And they really try to redistribute uh, food that way to prevent waste. And they use a lot of sustainable companies that are also upcycling different food. I just got pita that was actually upcycled from grain from a brewery. And I thought that's amazing, you know, and so I'm even in just buying from certain companies, I've changed my lifestyle. And I'm now learning about all these amazing companies that just are doing little things, you know, just changing one bread item and thinking about how to recycle, um, you know, grain or how to recycle some other um kind of uh, waste component from the production process. I, you know, I tell people they listen. I don't always get somebody to do the same thing. I've realized that, you know, not everyone is going to change immediately, but my goal is to kind of plant seeds everywhere I go, just kind of plant seeds and then, you know, kind of watch my garden grow over time as people start to do little behaviors. So, you know, I'm, I'm in their heads and, you know, oh, what would Edgley do with this wrapper? Oh, I bet Edgley would yell at me if she saw me throw this in the garbage. And everyone knows that, you know, there's only a few rules that that I have in my classes, but that's a big one. Not to put anything that, um, you know, isn't actual waste in the garbage if we can actually divert it. And so between the plastics and the, the candy and snack wrappers and other collections, I've really been able to get students to identify their own level of waste. Because when it comes to the actual concept of 
reuse, you know, reduce, reuse, recycle. Most of us really just focus on recycling. You know, having a water bottle, oh, it's clean, it's going to be recycled. But that's still waste. It's still creating a lot of waste. So for me, I really am trying to get people to identify the reduction part first, and then also teach them how to reuse and then also how to reduce. If we can get something to get a second life and not just think, okay, this is just going to exist in, you know, today, single use plastics, a lot of people know that I'm very, I'm very adamant about not using single use plastics. I'd rather do the dishes than put out tons of paper plates and plastics at a party. But I know that it there's a convenience factor too. And I have to understand people's needs. So by just helping helping them to consider a couple changes here, you know, maybe change the napkins that day, maybe, you know, um, Think about sustainable forks instead of the other types of single-use plastics. I'm now going to have your voice, uh, Professor Edgley. <laughs> my toothpaste uh, tube when it's done, and now I'm no longer going to be able to just throw it in the garbage. I'm going to have to think about how I get that box in my home to make sure that I'm, you know, mm. putting all of that stuff in places where I can then drop them off. Because you said so many things that I think most people are not aware of. Correct. So you are truly like the sustainability ambassador, and I can't imagine that Kane is going to go from. A a silver star in that higher education uh, rating of looking at sustainability to gold. I mean, just some of the things that you've said, if we can really start to have those differences happening on campus, mm -hmm. you know, and instilled in the minds of our students as they come through Kane University, imagine after, right, they leave sure. and go on to do other things. So I just want to thank you for that. Yeah. Awesome. Allison, um, well, I started by saying, you know, like I hope we have somebody today who's doing these things, uh, not just talking about it. And you live this lifestyle. It's fascinating. A little scary, too. I'm like, wow, like I can I'm picturing like, wow, living with her. It's like you'd bite something and be like, oh, what do I do with this now? You know, we do it. Um, it's really awesome. Awesome. Um, I, I once uh, watched a principal do a food audit. Um, a garbage audit, basically, mm -hmm. in a cafeteria that, of a school that had between six and 700 students, uh, I forget. So they laid tarps on the floor. And everything that went in the garbage, they emptied onto the tarp. Mm. And then he and a couple of teachers actually sifted through and they wore protective gear and they sifted through all of the garbage and sorted it in piles to see how much waste was food, how much mm -hmm. was plastic. I mean, it was extraordinary. And I, and I think the piece to a big exercise like that, the really important pieces. So everybody sees it's being done. So even with you, with, with what you're doing in terms of taking a Dorito bag out of the garbage, you're setting an example. But I think the really critical piece is the purpose of it and really why, right? It's, it's, it's not just the good of society, but what is, what is the impact of these small little actions uh, or what is the hope of this impact? And how do we, so two things, what is, what is the impact, but also how do we, um, how do we portray that this is really important to our students? How, how do we give them that, that global perspective uh, when many, uh, many teenagers or young adults are kind of thinking about their own world and their sure. own space? I know that a big part of everything is consistency. And I think that there is a lot of education. I, I find that my students really understand the impact of waste and the impact that we are doing, you know, emissions getting even beyond, you know, the things that we can control at this moment. And I think that they want to help. But I think that the problem is, is that they don't realize how simple some of the, you know, some of these resources are to be able to actually utilize. And I think that's a big part of it. If students can see that and they can, and I love the idea of the visualization. I'm very big on visualizing. I like, you know, if I could dump my box out after stuffing it properly, I would to kind of show them, you know, look at what we have actually produced just as classes over a semester, just my students. Look at the waste that we've actually produced versus what this looks like when you multiply it across the whole entire campus. So I think that a lot of students, I think that it's all about resources. If they're given the resources, they will use them. But if something is a little bit less attainable or it's not manageable, it becomes less, it becomes more of a challenge. For instance, students will refill water bottles. If there isn't a refill station nearby though, then if they need that hydration, they likely will go and buy that bottle, that plastic. And so it's having the resources available, having things accessible, but I really believe that visual, the visual piece, you know, things have to exist, right? 
for people to see. If it's always happening behind the scenes, it, it's only going to be a small group. It's not going to be that bigger community piece. So I think that if more people are seeing, you know, different recycling and, and things laid out in a certain way, it'll start to, real, you know, make them think about it. And they won't just put, you know, their whole entire... Uh, waste from their lunch into the compost bin, they're actually going to say, oh, no, only my apple core goes in there and the rest goes in here. So I think a lot of it is just seeing it. And I think that's a big way I can be I can be myself all the time and be consistent and, you know, silently shame people for, you know, their <laughs> their improper waste or use of uh, an item. But I realize that that also doesn't help. Right. You can't just make people feel bad for something they're doing. You have to and create and, you know, going back to what you were asking, create the value to see where, you know, the future we cannot eat money. Right. So the future is ours. And if we don't have a land or a space or resources to cultivate, you know, and consume, then we won't have anything. So I really don't try to be that, uh, you know, that person that, you know, is always doom and gloom about the potential for our, our loss of resources. But I just try to let people know this is, you know, what could happen. This is what could happen if we don't change. And these are the things that can happen if we do. And so by even, you know, when I see that one student that actually saved their wrappers or saved their plastic over the weekend for me, I realize, you know, this is going to work. This will actually make some change, even if it's only one or two a semester, because then they're going to tell someone else, look how easy it is. Um, I have bags of garbage left on my door and my I have them in my mailbox on my door and I go through it and I sort it. Some of it still is just garbage, but the others I can then get. So, you know, things have to be made easy and the value has to be seen that, you know, this is their future. This is your, you know, this is going to be your, your land. This is going to be your life. And if you realize that you can make it that much better and you can make it longer, I think people will really see the true value in it. I know what I'm getting um, mm -hmm. Professor Edgley for Christmas. <laughs> a big, compost, a big, big bag compost. of garbage. <laughs> <laughs> Look what I saved for you. I can't lie. I have been gifted a compost bin for my birthday before. I so. love it. I absolutely love it. You know, in the African-American community, there's this um, saying, each one, teach one. Mm -hmm. And so to your point of even if it's just one or two students, they will go and maybe tell their friends and family members. And so that's just sort of exponentially sort of grow this movement to yes. Mike's point about how we get the students to really kind of see this in their day to day and understand how they become involved. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and to that point, how does collaboration play a role in the work that you're doing on campus? Um, collaboration in terms of, you know, scaling up what you're doing in your classroom with your students, amplifying the, the message and seeing action around sustainability with other departments around the university and as well as the neighborhood in which Kane finds itself, right? Whether mm -hmm. that is our Ocean County campus, the Union County campus, or the Skylands. And I know there's a lot that goes on in the Skylands with Dr. Shevitz and our environmental science students. Mm -hmm. But uh, what does that collaboration look like? And, and is there an intentional um, plan to engage others? Well, I believe collaboration is the only way that we're going to be successful. You have to work together. You have to get people on board because if somebody isn't consistent with the vision or the mission, then that's going to bring us back a step. We're not going to be able to continue with the trajectory of moving forward and actually becoming, you know, a very sustainable institution. And uh, even going back to mentioning the Founders Day last year, because I was collecting and I had other alumni there, I actually had a conversation with another alum and he actually started saving his plastic and brought it back onto campus months later and delivered it to the bin where we are actually collecting in the science building. So I, you know, I realized that even, you know, people who were once a part of our community still feel connected to us and that they are also valuable resources for continuing this movement and, you know, building the momentum. So I think that there has to be collaboration. That's why with the task force, there were so many of us involved. And it was voluntary. When you have people who genuinely want the change, I think you will get it. If you start making it a task that people have to do, then it becomes a chore. And so it has to be something that the people who are actually on the force or on the committees really want to do and see. And by seeing the ways that we work together, 
I just found that everyone worked so well together. And even areas that perhaps we were not on directly, we were able to then say, okay, I can help with operations too. I can add a few more points here. And then we started to also say, hey, we also have a good idea for you with your engagement. Maybe we can create this. So by, you know, kind of cross pollinating, not only are we sharing ideas, but we're also finding more efficient ways to get things done. Because if we try to do everything ourselves, it's going to burn us out and it's going to be very challenging to keep the long term, right? The idea of sustainability means that, you you know, you can't burn out too soon in the short uh, term. You've got to actually have things that are in, you know, um, more of a succession kind of plan. This is what we will be doing and consistently doing, but also be willing to change when there's something new that can help or be willing to integrate new ideas as well and just always be open. I think that's a huge part of community and collaborating. You've got to, you know, when you're making a decision, you're problem solving, you have to keep your mind open. You have to listen to everyone's ideas because someone might have something that seems trivial, but all of a sudden you realize, wow, we can run with this. That can really be impactful and also even easily executed. Do you have an example of that, of uh, something that maybe uh, one of your colleagues uh, thought about in this process that just was something that people never thought, well, that's the way that we can address this or handle or approach this, not to put you on the spot, just kind of curious. Well, I, I, I know that just having that initial email from Professor H saying, hey, what do you think about this program? You know, just saying, you know, what do you think? Why don't we just join it? And for fun, you know, it can't hurt to collect. They're still going to take it. They're still going to properly dispose of it. If we don't earn the bench, you know, we still did something good. So I think even with something like that, just I saw this program online, Let's go ahead and join it. Let's see what happens. And then now all of a sudden, we have now been able to divert hundreds of pounds. And it is a task, it is, but we've now made it where we have a system. And if we start to open it up to more individuals, that will just make it more impactful. So I'd say something like that, you know, just, hey, let's see, see, what, see what happens. I know when it comes to composting, that's a much bigger initiative on campus and that has been a, uh, reinforced a lot more. So little things, you know, uh, even with operations, thinking about water stations, maybe we can get a few more water stations because when they become visible, we might be able to get a few more students to start bringing those eco and refillable water bottles. And then little by little, we'll start to see more students do that. And now that accessibility is there. Thank you for listening to Urban Impact, a podcast produced by Kane, New Jersey's Urban Research University. Subscribe, rate, and review wherever you get podcasts. For more information, visit kane.edu forward slash urban impact.